taking a moment to pause, reflect, find something that, you know, brings you joy. I mean, if it's organizing, it's organizing, right? But like really take time for your own spiritual and mental health to keep you center and focus. I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And I'm Shannon Lucas. We are the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to catalyzing innate change makers to accelerate positive change around the world. This is our podcast, Move Move Fast, Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, where we highlight catalysts that are doing amazing things in the world to create positive change. In that vein, I am incredibly, incredibly honored to have time today with Council Council Member Mai Vang, who represents Sacramento's 8th City Council District. She's the daughter of Hmong refugees from Laos, a proud Sacramento native, and the eldest of 16 children. She also (laughs) teaches in the Department of Ethnic Studies at California State University, Sacramento, and in the Department of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Before her election, she was busy then too. Bang served as the executive director of the Buck Scholars Association, and she founded Hmong Innovating Politics, HIP. She's worked on education, labor, racial and ethnic health disparities with local and national policy and government organizations. And she has worked tirelessly as a community organizer to improve health and educational outcomes for children and families in South Sacramento. Thank you so much for being here today with me, Council Member Bang. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's like super early in the morning, but I'm like re- ready to go. So let's go. Let's do this. Okay, Monday early. Let's do it. <laughs> I'd love to start off by hearing how do you relate to the concept of catalyst? How do I relate to the concept of catalyst? I think for me, um, it's about building power, building power of people on the ground um, and um, helping them recognize you know, their potential and them themselves being thrown catalysts in their community. Um, and now that you've asked that, yeah, like that, that's pretty much it for me. It's about building, building, building power on the ground for me. So, yeah. And when I got to chat with you earlier, you mentioned like, since your earliest toddler days, this is something that that resonates for you. So I'd love Uh, to just hear a little bit more. Yeah, you know, my two earliest memory as a kid, um, two earliest, if I close my eyes and think about the two earliest memory I can think of in terms of my childhood. One is um, and in our low-income one-bedroom apartment, uh, dancing in the living room with the sun beaming on my face. And the second memory is walking to the refrigerator to grab a bottle of milk for my mom to feed my little brother, uh, to feed my little sister. Um, and when I think about, <laughs> the concept of a catalyst. I think I've been doing this since I was a kid because being the oldest 16 kids, there's a lot of things that have to happen around the house. And so every time, you know, I'm with my siblings, I'm always trying to like, you know, help organize my siblings, really trying to um, increase the level of response to chores. <laughs> so, right. Like I've been doing that, taking care of my siblings. And so, um, yeah, I feel like it is part of kind of who I am. Um, building the power of people and building the power of my siblings so that I don't have to do one chore alone because there's so many of us um, that as a team, uh, you know, uh, many hands make um, work very light, right? So that's really important. So I would say, yeah, I think being the oldest of 16, I learned at a really young age um, the idea of collectivism, but um, also, you know, being a catalyst um, in terms of um, getting people to um, really um, respond to their own needs, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I love it because it's not just the catalyzing toward positive change, but it's the catalyzing others mm-hmm. toward positive change, that collectivism. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing those memories. Yeah. I'd love to hear what is it that you're catalyzing these days? Can you set a little context for us on what's, you know, kind of top of mind for you and how are you a catalyst within it? Yeah, you know, um, as a city council member, there are so many issues facing the city, everything from lack of housing uh, to, um, you know, uh, public safety, 
um, to um, the homeless crisis that we see on our street. Um, and when I was elected as councilwoman, I also entered the pandemic. And um, one of the biggest things that I focused on um, was really COVID recovery. Um, I represent a district that actually has the largest cases of COVID, not just in the city, but in the county. And there's multiple reasons why. I represent a community that's incredibly diverse, a low income. Um, I represent District 8, which is the southern part of the city of Sacramento, South South Park. So when you say South Sacramento, that's my district. Um, and there's multiple reasons why our district had the highest case of COVID. One, uh, during the pandemic, Many of the folks that uh, lived in our my neighborhood, my district, were essential workers. And so while some folks may have the luxury of working from home uh, online on Zoom, uh, many of the folks in my neighborhoods didn't because they were essential workers. The other piece is, um, you know, as I come from a really large family, and many of our families are incredibly diverse, but also live in multi-generational household big family. So when one person's infected with COVID, you can imagine I'm the oldest 16 kids. And if we all live together, if one person is infected, it spreads to the entire family. And that's the reason why uh, cases were so high uh, in, in my district, low income communities of color. Um, and so COVID recovery was one of my top priorities. And I remember the first time now there's vaccines, but back then vaccines were golden, right? It was really hard to actually get the vaccine. I think there was a time back last year when um, you know they were doing it in phases, right? First our seniors, right? Because you know uh, vaccines were slowly rolling out, but not enough. And so we had to do it in phases. And I remember um, when the first phase of vaccine came out, um, they were uh, giving out vaccinations in the wealthier neighborhood up in Notomas. Um, even though I had the largest cases of COVID uh, in the city and in the county, we didn't start here in South Sacramento. And so um, as a community organizer, I also learned very quickly, one, I am an elected, but the power of organizing people to put pressure, political pressure on jurisdiction that maybe oversaw vaccinations like the county for example the city doesn't oversee that because we're municipal so we you know handle the streets uh you know public safety parks but the county you know they oversee health and human services and so about 20 plus organization well started with like one or two key organizations you know we i got on a phone call and they were like you know on the phone actually crying because their seniors couldn't access the vaccine and i was like you know i'm not a i'm a city councilwoman i'm not a supervisor Right. Technically, they, you know, folks will argue that health isn't within my realm, but I have a public health background for me. Every policy is health policy. And so I said, you know, let's organize. You guys push on your end outside and I will do everything I can to secure a community center and lock in those vaccines. And I remember the first time I was able to actually lock in 1000 vaccine and that was like golden. Right. And then I had like community organizations, everyone fighting for a vaccine. And I brought the community together and said, look, I have a thousand vaccines. I'm gonna let you all decide how you wanna allocate this. And we sat in a Zoom meeting, talked it through, and we were able to allocate the thousand basically to various community groups that represented underrepresented communities. And it's not a coincidence that when we look at our vaccination clinic, our first vaccination clinic, 90% were communities of color with 50% of the participant coming in, not speaking English. I mean, those numbers look very different from the other clinics that um, were rolled out. Right. And there's a reason why, because we were very intentional about the people that we were outreaching to um, uh, limited English proficient uh, members in our community, um, 20 organizations that came together, all volunteer uh, ran. It was a people powered clinic literally for a year. Every Friday I was out there hustling, registering voters, uh, registering, not reg registering voters. Regist we also had people they wanted to vote as well, registering folks um, for the clinic. Uh, and I remember just doing translation as a councilwoman um, and folks didn't know that I was a councilwoman. They also thought I was just a volunteer. Right. And they were like, wow, it's so cool that Councilmember Vang is putting this on. And I'm like over here, like registering people. And I'm like, they're like, oh, this is the councilwoman. <laughs> I was like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Like you're working at a clinic. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Every Friday I'm here. I'm here because I, I truly believe that the team and the volunteer will only work as hard as the candidate or the elected. I think that's really, really important. So I'm always on the ground hustling with my team. Oftentimes I get uh, mistaken as the staffer of the councilwoman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, which is fine, you know, cause uh, I'd rather be mistaken as the staffer anyway. So that's just, that's kind of, kind of who I am. So very hands-on. And so it sounds like, of course, health, especially during the pandemic was top of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't just 
gaining the access to vaccines, it was organizing communities within your uh, district so that the pressure could get put on. And then once you had enough, it wasn't enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it was organizing them into Mm decision-making that could best support the community. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then when we were able to launch that first pop, it was a pop-up clinic and other electeds came from the county and other health industry came and they were like, how were you able to do this? Right. I was like, I didn't do it. It was the community that did it. It was 20 organization from our coalition, Sacramento Alliance for Vaccine Equity, right? The Black churches, Southeast Asian community groups, La Familia that, were, that really fought hard for the Latino community. I mean, it was 22 organizations that came together at work. And now we actually meet every Tuesday, weekly to provide updates about, um, you know, just COVID cases, um, information about what's happening in the community. So it's kind of become a hub of information sharing about what's happening. And it actually helps me again, like there are my eyes and ears on the ground about what's happening on the ground. Um, Cause there's only so many places that I could go to so many constituent of people I can speak with. Right. Um, and so now we've pivoted and we meet every every Tuesday at nine o'clock in the morning, um, strategizing and re-strategizing how to serve our community because things are always changing very, very quickly. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying that you didn't do the work. I imagine as other communities look for best practices though, having that central catalyst that organized the organization was, was critical. Yeah, yeah. And it's crazy, too, because I was like, now as a councilwoman, like when they saw that clinic, like um, um, the dollars started coming in. They're like, how can we support this clinic? Right. I was like, give the money to the organizations right, that, that are on the ground doing the work. And so now we have like grants coming our way to the Save Coalition. Kaiser Permanente threw in some money, PHI through public health um, threw in some money. Um, and then and then I always am completely transparent with the group. Like, this is how much funding they're giving our council office how do you all want to allocate this, right? I always let them decide um, in terms of the need of these dollars, right? To run the clinic, to provide uh, support for their own community events that they put on as organizations. Um, And when you're open, transparent, honest, upfront, yeah, I mean, it. It's not hard, but it's not magic either. It's like, it's like, right. That there's a formula that can be applied, but it, it is interesting, right? That it is, it is constantly seeing yourself as the servant of these other organizations rather than the head of the district. It's a, it's a different model. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, ab- absolutely. I work for them as I always shared, like, you know, this seat doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the former council member. It truly belongs to the people. Um, that's really important, right? And you're here in the seat really to one, be a good steward of community engagement and to listen to the people and find the resources um, so that they can really lead because, you know, oftentimes community folks are seen as the problem, but really they're the problem solvers. They know what's happening right. around and our job is as elected is to make sure that we get the resources to them. So I love that, that don't see them as the problem. It's like they, they help shine light on the problem so that they can be the problem solver. So we're getting to see here the positive outcomes, right? It's like the the fairy tale version of perfection. What were the challenges that emerged? You know, what were you learning throughout this process? Yeah, see, this is the reason why coalition building is so key. Um, I think when people don't talk to each other, I, I, you know, when you're, so here's the other part. When I was trying to organize folks, right, I realized organizations were not talking to each other. So some of the Black churches, some of the uh, AAPI, Pacific Islander group, who had really, um, when we look at their COVID, when, when their COVID cases and their rates, right, they were really, really underserved, definitely didn't have access. But when I was able to bring the groups together to really talk about the complexity and issues, health disparities within their own community, because you definitely can, you definitely can see everyone's fighting for their own community, rightfully so, right? Because everyone's been underserved, right? But when I was able to bring everyone together to really talk about the complexity of this issue and access, right? It all made sense, you know? And I think one of the challenges for me was like, I was excited, but scared because I was like, oh, oh," like for example, the 1000 vaccines, right? I'm like, how is this gonna go down, right? Like I'm gonna put folks in Zoom, you know, I'm gonna be facilitating this conversation, right? Everyone's going to be like, well, I should get like 500 or 300 or 200, right? 
And I kind of just lay out like, here are the disparities. Here's what we know, right? Here are the various groups. Here's the demographics of our district, right? Um, you know, and want to hear from all of you. How do you think we should allocate this, right? Really brainstorming. And then we all can sense based on our conversation, everyone really advocating for their communities it came to a solution, right? And it was just so beautiful, right? When you're just honest, upfront, and maybe a part of it is like being able to help facilitate too, so that conversation, but it was kind of challenging at first, right? Um, because you definitely had certain groups saying, well, so-and-so usually they get access, and then that group would say, we never have access, right? And I'm like trying to find a common ground with different groups and realizing like they're not even hearing each other. They don't even know, you know, the inequities happening within their own communities. I'm going to bring them together because really we're all fighting for crumbs right now. And literally 1,000 vaccines sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot, right, for our first pop of vaccination. So when I was able to bring folks together, and you know what's crazy is that when we did different allocations, um, you know, I also said to folks, you know, you can't reach your 200 goal, we're going to check in like the next day, right, and we're going to pivot, like if you can't reach that number, you know, because the thing is the vaccine has to be used on site, once they're open, they have to be used, right, and so every group was like shuffling the vaccines, right, like saying, hey, we didn't reach our numbers, you know, um, you know, hip, would you, would you like these these extra vaccines, we weren't able to hit our target, right? We did we did the calling, we did all of that. And so everyone was just like working together to make sure that we vaccinated our community, right? And so it was just like a really beautiful thing, but it was also challenging at first because I think folks didn't really understand um, some of the issues and the struggles within their own, within other communities, right? It was really important to, to have them all hear each other out, so. That's really interesting that even though your core philosophy is to create positive change through others, the key challenge is recognizing that when you bring others together, there will be misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. There will be, you know, beliefs that are wrong. And so your role as a facilitator of that conversation becomes really important. Yeah, because the other piece, I move really fast, right? So for me, it's like, get the vaccine, get the Pinnell Center, you know, I think as an organizer, right, this has to be a people powered campaign. I don't got money to pay folks. We got to get folks vaccinated. The community is passionate. They say, give us a vaccine. So I just move quick, right? And then I'm like, oh, snaps. Now that I have the vaccines, okay, how are we going to do this? Right? <laughs> like, I got 20 plus organizations that, right, that are working with seniors, right? So it's like, then that's like the, I wouldn't say like a downside, but it's like a delta, like areas of improvement, right? Like, okay slow down my, now that you got this, like, here's a challenge, <laughs> you know? So as a catalyst, I move really fast, but then you also have to be very intentional, right? When mm -hmm. you, as you're moving, you have to be intentional because you could lose people along the way. And I don't, that's the last thing I want to do is like, as you're moving folks, you also don't want to lose people. Um, because I don't, I actually think that's harmful to the movement, right? Cause you want to bring people along. Right. So it's yeah. a perfect transition for us into our rapid fire questions. And the first one being, you know, if we, if you could go back and visit your 20 year old self, what advice would you like to give her as a catalyst as she's beginning on this journey? Or said another way, what are the actionable nuggets that you can hand out to the catalysts out there? You know, I was so terrified. I still am, but I was so terrified when I was in my twenties. I think about hip when we co-founded hip, I'm like, you know, at that moment, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like internally, I was like, I have no clue what I'm doing. All I know is that our community is not registered to vote. There's no one reaching out to our communities. Let's just start a voter registration forum, right? A, a voter, a voter registration, do a forum, translate some of the ballot into Hmong, put a community event together, right? Just because no one's doing it, right? But I was scared because I was like, I've never done it. But if we don't do, who else is going to do it? Like if we don't step up, who else is going to do it, right? And in that moment, I mean, there were so many doubts um, I still moved forward, but there were so many doubts that I felt that that was probably the hardest thing was I was doubting myself so much, but the need was so dire that I did it. And I would remind myself if I could go back there and I would just be like, keep going, my keep going, right? That just keep going. You're doing it. You're doing it, you know? So that's what I would tell her because I think there were many nights where she did want to give up, right? But she didn't because she heard that, that voice, right? Um, but if, if my could like go back in time and to be like, yo, I'm council woman, my vein, and you're going to be here one day. I just want you to know you're, you're killing it. Cause when I think about like just my journey, I'm like, 
damn, I started a nonprofit with my friends. Like we started with money in a shoebox underneath someone's bed. And now we're a statewide organization with so many staff, right? Doing, um, you know, youth empowerment, engagement, civic engagement, registering people to vote. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And I was like, damn, we created that y'all, you know, when we were young organizers and we were, you know, frustrated and angry, but we've learned to harness our fire. Right. I think I remember back then when we started HIP because we did protests because there were massive school closures in our district. Um, some of the home parents didn't know how to really navigate the political system, didn't even know there were school board meetings, who their school board members were. I mean, just how far we've come as young organizers, everyone's doing different things in policy and politics. Um, but we started that and it's just, it's like, yo, we did that as young, young organizers, right? Young 20 year olds, you know? And I was like, we did that. Yeah. Like a lot of electeds always thought we were some young, angry folks that were just going to protest and be gone afterwards. And it's like, no, nah, we stayed like even after the school closures, there was 13 schools being proposed to be closed in South Sacramento. We saved three of them, but we stuck around like the schools that were closed, like La, Fam like La Familia, which is an amazing nonprofit organization. Maple was one of the schools that were closed. It is now a community center for where Maple was hosting all of their COVID, their programming, uh, a Fruit Ridge Elementary School, which was closed uh, as well in South Sacramento. It is now a community hub of multiple nonprofits that is housed there at that school. And so we were proactive in like turning these school sites into community hubs. We didn't go away, right? Like some of the electives are like, oh, these are some rowdy, you know, rowdy young organizers. They're just there to protest and they'll, they'll be gone. But no, we actually ran for office too. <laughs> right? We like try to take people out who didn't understand our lived struggles of, of the community. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's really exciting to see just all of my friends and colleagues and everyone who co-founded HIP um, and to see the great work that they're doing in the community. It's pretty amazing stuff. So all the 20, 20 somethings out there, just keep going next next foot in front of the other. You don't yep. know where it's heading. Yeah. And what it, it matters. Building the pipeline, building the pipeline. You know, we have a, they have a youth advocacy program where they just train young people about how to organize, you know, how to turn out the vote, how to register folks. They have a whole program. It's all about building the pipeline, right? Building the pipeline of catalysts. Yeah, exactly. So with that, what advice do you have for leaders in finding and leveraging their catalysts? You know, I would say this, I would say, um, it takes a team to make the candidate or the elected or the company and the product. I'm a true believer of that, right? And so um, when I think about finding and leveraging catalysts, it's also about like, what is, what is it that you need in order to help you be the catalyst, right? And you're going to need other catalysts around you to help you catalyze, I guess, you know? Yeah. And so, um, right. So I would also say, you know, finding, I mean, under, well, I, I would say if you're an executive understanding what the weakness of your company is, the weakness of you as a candidate, as a leader and identifying what amazing skill set and talent each person that comes into your space have, and then allowing them to bloom with their passion on your team. Yeah. Because they will become a catalyst based on their passion. And they're also supporting you know, um, your collective agenda, right? I mean, I've, I've learned that like definitely that I have uh, blind spots and um, it's so important to make sure that um, I surround myself with other catalysts that um, has a strength and a passion and where I'm weak at, right? Cause that's what their strength is, but they're hella good at it, right? And you watch them go and just like, go, 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 right? And so I, for me, and it's also about building the type of your team too, right? Everyone around you, I would argue is a catalyst in their own right, right? Because they're so passionate or whatever they're doing, they're, I'm, I'm hoping they're passionate about it, right? That's how you right. have it, you blossom. Um, and so I would always say, think about building your team, but thinking about your own kind of blind spots in your company as an elected, as a leader, and then um, really plugging folks in that has that passion, that skill set, and then watching them do their magic. And they are a catalyst within their own right, right? Um, I love it. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst part about being a catalyst? I think I, I, you know, now that I'm reflecting on it and just our conversation is that we move hella fast. Right? <laughs> We move hella fast, like hella fast. Yep. Um, and trying to be intentional during that process sometimes is really hard because you already see the vision. Like for me, I do see it, but I'm like, okay, let's go, go, go. 
right? But then there are maybe steps that has to happen to get there, right? I mean, you got that that grit, that passion. Our hashtag, my our hashtag, my hashtag when we started running my campaign, it was heart and hustle. Cause someone's like, damn, she has hella heart. And then she's hella hustling. I was like, oh my God, heart and hustle. That's our hashtag. Um, but in that, like um making sure you have intention and purpose, because you can have hella passion, right? And you can have hella hustle, like you're working all grinding all the time, but there's got to be intentionality and purpose behind it. Right. And so I think one of the downside of being a catalyst is like you have to always make sure you're always being intentional about how you move. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really key. Cause you could just keep going and without forgetting that part, right? Like, why did I do this again? Like, what was the purpose, you know? Um, so yeah. and it sounds like you're very good at communicating that to the organizations you're bringing together to your team, that there's a, like a repeat cycle that you do of this is what we're here to achieve. Mm -hmm. You have to, because you can get lost in the details because especially when I think city government, like things get very complex. It's not always black and white. It's much more complicated. There's like legal issues. You're like, oh, you can't do that because of this. Well, it's like, oh, I didn't think about that. Well, what about this? Right. And then you get very lost in the details. And sometimes you have to take a step back and be like, okay, why are we doing this again? Like, what is the outcome for this? Like, what are we trying to solve? Like, you know, who are those closest to the pain? This is the reason why we started this, right? What are they saying? You know, what is the solution? What is their solution to this issue? How do we get them resources, right? So always having to pause in those moments, I think is really important. If if you're a catalyst, I think you can get lost in that and you move fast. We move fast, right? Because we, we want to see action. We want to see things change. Um, which is probably another, yeah, another, another, (laughs) right? Like we move fast and we want to see change quickly. Yes. So what's the best part of being a catalyst then? Wow. The best part is like seeing community and people find their own power. That's the best part. That's like hella fulfilling for me. Hella joy for me is when I see community folks just killing it, like, like winning, you know? Um, yeah, that's the part. Like, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the best part about being Catholic. Just seeing people, seeing people like find their own power and just doing it. It's yeah. super rewarding, isn't it? Mm-hmm. When that thing that you've been visioning like comes into being, and it's bigger than you at that point when you see Absolutely. the community killing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So as we wrap up today, Council Member Vang, what is your call to action that you'd like to leave for our listeners? You know, I would say, I mean, there's so many things, but I think one thing I will share, um, if you're listening to this, I, I, and I'm still learning how to do this. You know, you hear a lot of stuff about like self-care. I was like, what's that? Right. Like, (laughs) I, (laughs) but I do think that's so important. Um, really, really important as my dog is laying right here doing some self-care. See, she's just chilling right here. See, yeah. Hello. I, yeah, I really do think like taking a moment to pause, reflect, find something that, you know, brings you joy. I mean, if it's organizing, it's organizing, right. But like really take time for your own spiritual and mental health to keep you center and focus. Like that would be my call to action because, um, there are a lot of needs in our community, a lot of challenges and um, change isn't gonna happen overnight. It will happen for sure, uh, but we need each and every one of you in this fight um, and we can't do it alone. And so we need you, which means that you gotta take care of yourself. You really have to take care of yourself. And so, you know, my call to action would be for each and every one of you who's listening um, to make sure that you make time to take care of yourself because we all need each other. Um, in the long run to really create a better world for the ones we love and for our community. So that's my call to action to all of y'all. I love it. We have a a saying that we frequently repeat that a burned out catalyst makes no change at all. Oh, it's true. Yeah. Right. If you, if you aren't taking care of yourself, how do you have the energy to connect and to continue to do the amazing work that needs to be done? Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you for that call. And thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, yeah. It was <clears throat> lots of fun. Lots of fun. So I am excited to continue to watch how you transform and <laughs> catalyze Sacramento's South, South, South. Yes. City Council District. Let's go. Let's go. 
And to our audience, thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about how to accelerate positive change, go to our website at www.catalystconstellations.com and be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out. If you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way. 